Well, good afternoon. Uh, as uh, Sean said, uh, my name is, Ho I call myself in this particular one, Jose, the Oprah impersonator, Colucci Rios. So I'm going to be the, the moderator for this panel. And before we start introducing the other members of the panel, I would like to thank the USPTO for this invitation. Uh, it's interesting for you to know, I used to be a patent examiner, and for some reason, apparently they like me because they keep inviting me <laughs> so for this event. So thank you for the USPTO to do that. So what we're going to do here is we have like three distinguished members here that is going to give you the whole overview from going from an inventor's point of view to be a manufacturer, what our agency does with regard to helping those manufacturers, and also some technical uh, support that we can provide as part of the NIST MEP. So why don't we start then uh, for each one of the panelists to introduce themselves. So why don't we start here with, uh, with John. Hi. Uh, my name is John Gaskins. I'm a CEO of Laser Thermal. We're a small, and by small I mean about 10 people, manufacturer down in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, and we manufacture um, sort of high-end thermal metrology tools, so things that are of use for semiconductor and power, power electronics industries. Um, and I came out of UVA in an academic background, so um, I have far and away the least experience in manufacturing on this panel. But I um, thankfully have been able to connect, um, as Jose was saying, with a lot of people who are very knowledgeable. So hopefully the uh, perspective that I can give is one of um, failing and where to find friends who can teach you how to maybe not fail as much. I'm Steve Dalton. I'm with uh, GenEdge. GenEdge is a MEP, which is a Manufacturing Extension Partnership. There's an MEP in every state of the United States plus Puerto Rico. And what we do is actually pro uh, provide support through consulting services for manufacturing, research and development, and engineering firms. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marlon Walker. I'm the technical manager for MATTER, which is the MEP Assisted Technology and Technical Resource Service. Uh, more on that later. I've been at NIST. I'm at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. That's where NIST MEP is based. I've been there for about 34 years. I'm a chemist by training, and so very happy to meet you all, and hopefully we'll have a very interesting discussion today. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, we have a, a few questions here that we're going to be uh, asking our panelists. And uh, the first one, we're going to start here with, uh, with John, and basically, uh, why don't you start telling about your journey, I guess we call it, from inventor with that light bulb idea? To now becoming a manufacturer. So, John, why don't you elaborate on some of that? Sure. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a long journey. Um, <laughs> it started um, almost a decade ago um, when I joined a lab at UVA um, as a postdoc um, and then eventually moved into a research scientist role. And, and the reason that that's where the manufacturing journey and invention journey really started for me is because um, although I've only been doing manufacturing for about two years, for us, much of the R&D that goes into what we do now today as a company um, started uh, back at university, so at the University of Virginia. Um, and the light bulb for me was when I joined that lab, and uh, it was something completely different from what I had done in my PhD, and it was, uh, you know, I was really learning new things every day. But when I joined that lab, uh, the first question I asked was to, to my co-founder, Patrick, was, and like, this is so needed. We have all these industrial customers who are doing all these things. Like, why hasn't somebody commercialized this? And then fast forward a year later, I went back to him and I said, I understand why people haven't commercialized this. This is a terrible problem, and, and it's very hard to do. <laughs> um, but it, o over the years after that, um, I think sort of a constant, you know, just thing in the back of my mind was, man, there's got to be a way to do this, right? There's got to be a way to do this. <laughs> Um, and so over the course of the next, you know, five to seven years, we started to pull the pieces of the puzzle all together and figure out, okay, well, maybe, you know, if we take some, some things from fiber optics and telecommunications and we do a few things and, you know, be tricky about how we do things here and there, all right, we're closer and closer to a solution that I think we can deliver this. We, like, we could actually deliver this as a product to somebody and they could use it and not have to be, be sitting in a lab with, you know, so in our in the lab at UVA, it's like an eight by four foot optical table with just crazy stuff, and you're just like, that's it's not approachable at all, right? Um, and so I think 
you know, from the start, it was trying to think about, all right, how do I make this approachable and scalable, right? Because, you know, making something approachable does not mean that you can scale it nor that people actually want to use it. Um, and so from, from that sort of light bulb way back at the beginning to where we are now, being in manufacturing for the past two or three years, um, you know, a lot of those concepts that we learned at the university, um, being in touch with vendors, understanding who your salespeople are, having relationships with them. Um, there are a lot of things that are relational about manufacturing. I, I think I've heard that a few times. Like relationships and manufacturing matter. Um, there are people, especially in my case, who know so much more about things than I do, right? And so leveraging those relationships and trusting those people who know more than you, these guys over here, um, <laughs> is, is a really important part of getting to a place faster than you could by yourself, right? You cannot do things in manufacturing and in invention and, and in pretty much anything in life without trusting and leaning on other people who have expertise and making sure that that is where you go when you're just like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Thank you, John. And let me then apologize to Steve and Marlon because that's going to be a very hard act to follow. So sorry, guys. But anyway, uh, <laughs> John mentioned that these two guys actually helped him doing this whole transition from this light bulb all the way to the manufacturing and commercialization, which is not the same thing. So, why, Steve, why don't you tell us, you know, what was your collaboration here with John? It was kind of interesting. It's probably been about a little over a year ago. Um, I happened to be in a hotel up in Charlottesville, Virginia, and John calls me late one afternoon at 4.30 and says, uh, Steve, I'm not sure you can help me or not, but I saw this website, I ran into it, and I just want to see if you might be able to be a support to me. And so 8.30 the next morning I was at his office, and uh, we happened to have, I guess, a grant that worked out well for him, and we actually started with him. We've been working with him ever since, and um, it actually started out first with a, what's called a market commercialization assessment. We sat down with John and his, his group, and we went over his current state, where he is currently, and also looked at how uh, what the future state of his market commercialization plan would be. So he was able to look at that, look at different aspects, where he is currently and where he needed to be, and we actually had one somebody from our organization that's um, expert in marketing research and kind of market planning kind of helped him and his company through that. From that, uh, we were able to help him with 2D layout. So he has a location and so at where to put machinery, where everything kind of flowed in the process. We actually brought an engineer in. I actually kind of did a value stream map of exactly uh, – what the manufacturing process should be in current state and then we did future state of what he would like and he just moved to another facility as well and we kind of helped with that 2d layout of, of that so he was able to bring some of the process that he was doing outside inside and he has more control over it now uh, we actually work with capital planning um, and when you get in different phases of manufacturing you need money and so looking at different ways, the different avenues to, to get monies, et cetera, that's needed in the different phases. So we helped with that also. Um, I've got a background in executive coaching. So we've had multiple sit-downs just to kind of say, hey, where are you at now and uh, what, what does it look like? So I'm not the expert. This, this guy's like a rocket scientist here. He is a <laughs> rocket scientist. So... You know, I'm just asking the what questions so that he can make his own decisions, but help him kind of think outside the box in order to move to the next step. Because as an entrepreneur, you guys are wearing about 30 or 40 different hats. John is no different. And so, so during some of those sessions, it's just kind of like, huh, let's just take a deep breath and let's see what the next step is. So that's just some of the things that we kind of helped out with. Uh, I think one other thing we did help out with also is that he needed a user manual written, and we did the technical writing for his user manual for that. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Steve. And you heard from John and also Steve that, you know, the company is a very high-tech company, 
And, you know, again, even we know John is very knowledgeable and very intelligent. Sometimes you need help on the technological component. And we have here Dr. Marlon Walker, who actually worked with Steve, via Steve to start also helping John with regard to some of the technological challenges that he was facing. So, Dr. Walker, why don't you elaborate on how we collaborated with both Steve and John? Thank you, Dr. Rios. And, uh, well, as Steve said, that, uh, that question, what, is a very powerful question. So Steve asked John, what else can we do to help you succeed? John mentioned, well, we do need to understand something about our system, and I'll let John describe his system if he, if he you know, it is a bit proprietary. But Steve asked John, what could be done? John told uh, Steve, well, we do need some technical assistance. So Steve, as a member of the Virginia MEP, which is also called GenEdge, contacted the Matter Service. Now, once again, Matter is the MEP-assisted technology and technical uh, resource service. And it's a way that we link the needs of small and medium-sized manufacturers with the expertise in the NIST labs. If a manufacturer should have a technical problem with a product or process, they can basically appeal to NIST MEP to ask for assistance from a researcher in the NIST labs. And in case you aren't familiar with NIST is, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It is the National Metrology Laboratory of the U.S. So people there are expert in terms of understanding how to measure things. So with that request, and with this, this was matter. So Steve submitted a request uh, on behalf of John's company for technical assistance. We were able to find a NIST researcher to help John with particular issues that he had about his product. Now, one other dimension to matter, and that is we've enhanced the program and branded it as Matter Plus. So many of you all are not familiar with an MEP is. That's okay. With Matter Plus, you don't have to be a client of an MEP center. You can appeal directly to NIST for technical assistance, merely by going to the uh, basically MEP website, which is just nist.gov forward slash MEP. You'll see Matter and Matter Plus on the landing page. And by clicking on Matter Plus, you can read how you can get technical assistance from NIST with the technical problem product. Uh, any organization, any agency, any manufacturing, supporting manufacturing can apply for assistance. And it's the F word. It's free. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that F word. <laughs> Back to you, Jose. Yeah. Thank you, Marlon. Uh, let me do a quick uh, survey here. I know we have like 200 people online, but how many people are here from Virginia? Okay, how about Maryland? All right, so <clears throat> you just met Steve, uh, all those from Virginia or even Maryland. You have an amazing center in, both, in, in those two states. I mean, and when I'm saying amazing, I mean, these guys would actually are one-stop shop to meet the needs of manufacturers. That's what they do. So, you know, for those of you that are in Virginia or even Maryland, you know, you can contact either one of us and we can basically connect you with those two centers in case you want to have conversation with them. And I know there's hundreds online, and so I apologize that we don't include them. Anybody from West Virginia by any chance? Well, West Virginia also has an amazing center, so <laughs> yeah, just to be clear. So since uh, I used to be a patent examiner, and I know that here right now we are at the mecca of the uh, IP world of the United States, we need to talk about IP. And as you heard you know, from all three of them, there's a lot of technology involved here. There's most likely there have to be some intellectual property involved. So let's start with John again, whether he can tell us about intellectual property, how he's gonna look at it, how he has been looking at it. So go ahead, John. Yeah, certainly. So I think again, it sort of stems back to my time at, at UVA. Um, when we were coming up with these concepts uh, that were 
helping us translate from the lab scale to the, you know, ultimately the commercial scale. Um, one of the things that we always thought about was, you know, are there places where we can protect what we're thinking about, what we're creating, what we're talking about? Um, and uh, the first step in that was always for us um, was a provisional patent, um, which I, I know that that's been talked about in previous sessions as well. Um, but that was always a first step for us. Uh, I think I heard at least one person say earlier, you know, because you then get 12 months where you figure out all those things that you don't understand and, and that you don't know. Um, and for us, it's even gone beyond that where um, we're at the point now for our first patent that I believe we filed in 2015, um, we now have two uh, child patents that are follow-on patents from that that are honing even further the mm -hmm. patent application that we had back from 2015. So we are keeping alive the patent that we had initially and uh, predating our filing date um, by keeping that patent alive. So that, that's something that um, I never knew about until um, you know, probably about three or four years ago, the opportunity to um, hone your patent a little bit more as you continue to learn more and find different use cases um, that were really based around that initial patent, but you may just not have had enough information at that point in time. So um, that's something that you know, I think is useful to, to sort of throw out there as something that people don't always uh, refer to. Um, but then also just the filing of the patent, um, it is a grueling process. We were very fortunate that we were in a university system that supported that process. Um, but we've since done it um, outside of the university system. And I think for us, the, the concept is always to try and be as broad as possible. I know, you know any patent lawyer you're going to talk to is say, be as broad as possible, try and cover as much as you can. Um, one of the patent attorneys I work with um, always says, if we get 50% of our claims rejected, then we've done a really good job. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. So try, try and get more covered, covered than you can and, and try and fight back and claw back whatever you can. Um, but so for us, as, as sort of on the tech side of things, we certainly use patents as a strategy to cover um, IP and, and, and what we're producing, what we're manufacturing, um, and, and what we're selling to our customers. Thank you, John. And I, I don't think this is a fair question to you, but I might as well ask you and then have Steve Moore elaborate on that. But could you give some insight of when to patent and when to not? I mean, like, is there certain sectors that you know? And I know you are in one sector, but sorry about that. But I'll, I'll have Steve that's probably broader to talk more about it. But any comments on when to patent and when to not? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, my brain's racing a mile a minute now. Um, I think for us, personally as a company, um, we look at the technology that we've created and we try and identify um, by looking at prior art, um, things that we A, believe that we can protect and B, believe are not so crucial to the underpinning workings of what we're doing. So if we can protect it, then we want to patent it. Okay. Um, if we're not sure if we can protect it or it's so crucial to our technology, then we don't want to patent it, you know, and that would fall more under the guise of a trade secret. Yeah. Um, so there, there is, for us especially, there's a trade-off between, you know, being as exhaustive as we can in, in what we're protecting versus protecting things that have taken us, in some cases, a decade to figure out. So, Steve, you, you heard me say, Steve, name dropping quite a bit here. So, why can't you, maybe you can talk about the intellectual property, not only related to John, but I know you deal with all, a bunch of other companies. And then also on my follow up questions, like, when do you suggest to somebody you should look into patenting or not, or trade secrets? Thanks for saying that too. So, go ahead, Steve. For the toughest, <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> toughest question of the day here. So, uh, I, again, sorry. I mean, I'm sorry, but... I'll start out by saying it depends, right? Um, it, I, personally, my, some of my background is innovation, and I've developed a couple products. Uh, the first product, I spent way too much money in the patent process, and I learned a lot. 
um, and then I had a couple more after that. And personally, I learned how to do it. So I started learning how to think like a lawyer <laughs> and um, actually did a lot of the upfront work myself. And I'll give you a little secret that I did personally is that I actually found a lawyer that was retired or semi-retired, and he worked from home. He was about a quarter of the price of someone he worked in a regular office. That's not for everyone. If you're in the technical field, et cetera, like John is, you need to you need to make sure everybody's up to date on everything. But that's personally that's some of the things that I did. From a Gen Edge point of view, if we have people that need help from a patent point of view, we really don't give advice on intellectual property. We can refer others to NIST if it's very technical, um, that kind of thing. We do deal with some entrepreneurs, and um, I will definitely try to coach them through the process. But also for some of the smaller, if you don't want to get into the manufacturing world, just remember uh, there's something called licensing. So if you wanted to license your product to someone that's already doing it, they may like your product so much, it may be the easy button for you. So that's just, I think it's my two cents yeah. from that. Thank you, Steve. And uh, Dr. Walker, by the way, uh, and I told him to stop that nonsense, he's very shy. So he doesn't really tell you that he's actually a true scientist. And he works like probably 20 plus years as a scientist at, at NIST, you know, doing like really high tech developments in the area of science and technology. And because they, he was there, he had to work with the technology partnership office, thinking of whether or not what he was working on basically can be patented, could be protected, and then put it in our portfolio of technologies that can be then, you know, uh, uh, commercialized. So maybe now you can talk about intellectual property, not only from the standpoint of your job now, which is basically helping small manufacturers, but also your personal experience, your professional experience before as a scientist looking at intellectual property. And again, sorry, apologies, you know, it's all improvised here. <laughs> it's so wonderful to have colleagues like Jose. <laughs> Uh, so he is correct. I was. I have been at NIST for 34 years. I was in the laboratory for 28, and I did play around with a few things and tried to patent one thing, which unfortunately uh, didn't get patented. But um, in my current job, because I have been at NIST so long, I'm great at facilitating understanding who might be able to answer what questions that come our way in terms of matter and the matter plus services. Uh, with issues involving intellectual property, let me just say this about matter and matter plus. Uh, if you were to ever submit something, we do our best to keep your information, your proprietary information confidential. Uh, we talk to mainly uh, federal employees unless you give us permission to talk to others because federal employees are covered by the trade secret Trade Secrets Act, so they aren't supposed to say anything about your information. Any ideas, any, any concepts, anything like that that involves intellectual property, we do have, as Jose mentioned, the Technology Partnership Office. And they handle all these things, including if you were to get into a relationship with a NIST researcher and you said, well, I want an NDA, then the Technology Partnership offer, Office would offer you a NIST NDA because that would probably protect the NIST scientists best. But in terms of issues like that, as well as uh, potentially CRADOs, Cooperative Research and Development Agreements, or NIST actually now has a CRADA light, if you will, which is a research collaborative agreement, the Technology Partnership Office would handle all details relating to that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Walker. I told you, oh. Can I touch on something Steve said? Uh, okay, we'll let it go uh, this time, but go ahead. Uh, Steve, Steve, Steve briefly mentioned something that you know, triggered something for me, and it's something that we're, we're dealing with now. He said whether it's, it's worth it to patent it, <laughs> which is a question that you do have to ask yourself because money does not grow on trees, and you have to protect your resources. You know, If you spend all of your money protecting your idea and your equipment, your invention, you may never invent it. Um, and so, you know, just 
understanding that there is a trade-off, I think for us, we've especially had to, to take a, a deep look at um, international uh, patent protection and whether we want to go down that route, understanding that we, we will be spending large amounts of money down the road. Um, and is there a point where it, it may not matter? And you know, is that 10 years in the life of our patent that we're selling internationally, at which point we have 10 years of protection and we may not care anyways. Um, so just sort of like, it, it's not always that, you know, we're definitely gonna patent everything everywhere we can. That's not a reality of life when it comes to economics and getting beyond an invention and going to commercialization and running a business and, you know, some of the hard decisions you have to make. Thank you, John. And, uh... For you that don't know me, some people claim that I'm very opinionated, and you know that's fine. I mean, I can live with that. But I do listen to people, and I'm listening to them, and I know John brought up the point that in addition to basically manufacturing things, you have to worry about other things. And one of the things that he mentioned was workforce. So uh, let me mention, I'm, I'm part of NIST also, the, from the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. I used to be a regional manager. Actually, I work very closely with Janesh. That's the reason I know them very well. And right now, our organization has a focus, very focused right now on three things. One of them is innovation and technology, which is the reason why we love Genetch, <laughs> because they're probably one of the, I, I cannot say are the top one because that other people get upset, but they were one of their top centers with regard to innovation and technology. I'll say they're the best one. <laughs> okay, fine. But then also we, as you all know, there's a lot of conversation right now in the U.S. about supply chain, the supply, supply network, the, the robustness of the supply network. And last but not least, we call it the workforce body gap. There's no people out there that you can hire to do that. So now we're going to do a switch here. And this is your fault, John, because you were the one that mentioned about people. And I know that Steve also basically has that, that he has to worry when people tell them, I need people, Steve, where can you find them? And that's what I know a lot of what Steve is doing. So let's switch here and let's start again. Well, let's start, let's start with Steve first, since you deal with that like every day with a bunch of companies about the workforce body gap and what can you do, are you doing right now? Yeah, with Gen Edge, uh, we do consulting. So when we go into manufacturing, says, you know, what's your two top gaps that you have within your manufacturing facility. One or two is going to be, can you get me bodies or can you get me people to work? And uh, so one thing that we do, um, one thing about Gen Edge, since we're, we receive monies from uh, nationally, from state, and we provide cash, we do cash business as well. So one thing that we do is we connect people. So everybody from NIST in general, to the local economic developers, SBDC, Go Virginia, um, Workforce Development, SCORE, whoever it may be, we connect people in those areas as well. And even the community colleges. I've actually go and visit community colleges in my area directly with their workforce to make connections to manufacturers, to make sure that they are connected and to figure some way to get the workforce in place for them. So that's just some of the ways that we try to do. It's mainly the connections. We cannot do it ourselves, but there are so many people that are in that realm that we definitely can make good referrals for people for that. Thank you. And Marlon, you're not gonna be exempt from this question, so get ready. So we're gonna first go to John with regard to but by the way, I don't know if you know this, but part of the reason we exist is because big companies come from small companies. <laughs> and we focus on small and medium manufacturers with the notion that those are going to become bigger. Right now, you heard John saying they got 10 employees. Well, what are the plans with regard to making it 20 or 30 or where are they going? And, you know, that's a strategic. But if you're going to go to 20 or 30, where are you going to find people? So maybe you can talk about your workforce plan and what are some of the challenges you're perceiving right now based on conversation with Steve. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm going to start every, every answer off that way. I think, so for us as a company, and again, I, I, I've heard this before up on the stage already, um, 
we have hired as much as, as we can out of either our personal network, my personal network, our employees' personal network. You know, hiring people who have the trust of others is is usually a really good idea. Um, you know, beyond that, um, just having frank conversations with people. I mean, you know, you want to make sure that when you're working with people, you enjoy working with them because it's part of the enjoyment of working is enjoying who you're around. Um, as far as like the actual workforce element of it, um, we, we trust LinkedIn. <laughs> wow. Um, we use LinkedIn a lot um, because it is, it is an easy way to reach a wide audience um, when it comes to hiring for us. Um, we're taking what I've been calling the, the great internship experience this summer where we're hiring five interns um, because for us, when we do look down the road to w what Jose was saying, you know, we're 10 people right now, we'll be 15 by July 15th. Wow. Um, and we know that we want to scale and scale quickly and identification of talent as early as we can um, and the fact that we can bring them in at a later date is pretty important to us because that again, once that person works for us for a summer, we would hope that they are then a personal connection of ours and we have that connection where, you know, if we trust them, then that's somebody who we would like to, to hire in the future. Um, and again, like the more people you have in your organization, um, talking to the people in your organization about people they know, right? You know, people know other people and if they trust them and they, they understand their skill sets, sitting around the dinner table or, you know, coffee and talking about all the great things that they're doing, well, maybe you need that thing in your organization, right? Um, and so asking people, um, I think we have, of our 10 hires, I think four or five of them are direct, um, you know, just direct friends or friends of a friend um, who were interested in what we were doing um, and found it more interesting than what they were doing when, when we hired them. <laughs> so. I think to add to what John just said, even before sending it out to LinkedIn is, don't do it alone. Don't try to invent what you have alone. Um, reach out to that HR person, that HR friend, whoever it may be. Really first hone in exactly who your target market is because you may be able to go in three or four different directions as you take your product to market. And truly understanding that is going to make a big difference in just say that the salesperson you may hire. And uh, John and I have sat down and went over exactly this, you know, before putting it out on LinkedIn. Let's really hone in on exactly what you're looking for in that person. What does that person look like? What, what kind of skills do you want them to have? What kind of, you know, because that's what you need to see on those resumes when they come in. You know, prepare the questions beforehand when you're interviewing these people. Uh, we do HR also at Gen Edge. We support HR and um, organizational development. So anything within the organization from TWI, training within industry, to DDI, leadership skills, et cetera, it's important to have the right people on your team. Just don't hire someone. And so I think uh, with John, he's done a tremendous job of doing that. But he's reached out for support as well with his network. That's important. Have your network ready. Thank you. And since I want to maintain my friendship with Marlon after we leave here, because we work together, I'm going to help him a little bit on answering the questions. Uh, Marlon and I are actually working on this initiative with regard to reaching out to uh, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic-serving institutions, and tribal colleges, because we are in the technology area. I mean, we, we're looking into advanced manufacturing, all these new developments that you hear a lot about in the news. That's what we do, especially because of our background. So, uh, Marlon, you're trying to help you here. So, what do you see when we're going to go on tour out there trying to start telling people to get involved more and more into these areas, especially? We, we're going to be going on tour soon. So, so go ahead, Marlon. Well, thanks, Jose, <laughs> again. Um, but he is right. We are looking to try to connect and partner with other HBCUs, tribal colleges and universities, and Hispanic-serving institutions because we see that's where perhaps manufacturing has not been appreciated for the opportunities it can afford. Mm -hmm. 
manufacturing now is not the manufacturing of your father. It is not dirty, dark, and disturbing, if you will. Advanced manufacturing is actually cool. <laughs> and if you're interested, NIST MEP actually on its website has videos called Heroes of Manufacturing where you get a chance to see what manufacturing is today and many concerns and whatnot. So that's what we are doing. We're, we're trying to get people to look at manufacturing as a career. Supposedly there are at least a million job, open jobs yeah. in manufacturing. And uh, there have been some pushes toward trying to automate things because people can't find workers. Mm -hmm. That being said, there's still tremendous opportunity for employment and careers in manufacturing. And we want to let people know this is an area they should look to. Thank you. We're still friends. Are we okay? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one thing about the, the uh, workforce component at the headquarters where we are both are, uh, we work closely with the centers, especially, you know, centers like Ginesh that are at the forefront. We we'll see, you know, what does a manufacturer need to attract people? I mean, so it's not just putting an announcement, I'm going to pay you $15, 20 $25 an hour. I mean, it's just because if somebody comes in with $0.50 cents dollar an hour more, you, you lose it. So... We're working together on basically transforming organizations to be a place where people can develop a career. So it's not a job. It's actually a career. So that's something that I give credit to them. I, uh, you can tell from my age that we were in that you put a paper on a door saying we're interviewing people, come in, and it, it, no, that doesn't work anymore. So, so now we're going to do a switch here. Uh, we're going to talk about supply chain and the supply network because if you're going to make something, I'll guarantee you, you're going to need somebody to actually provide you some of the materials that you're going to need. Uh, we're kind of on a time. I don't know. Sean, help me here. Uh, there's a question, or how do you want to handle those? Are we finished? Will you, you let me know. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I would say yes, it's definitely possible. All right. <laughs> but but so so let let me just clarify something though. I uh, I'm an expert. Marlon, repeat the question. Um basically she's asking if she could basically manufacture her own product. Okay. And how she could set it up. And I would say this. Uh Jose and I are facilitators. We're part of the federal government. We try to help manufacturers. We, we empower manufacturers as well as champion manufacturing. So we make connections. The people, the boots on the ground, are the 51 MEP centers, one in each state and in Puerto Rico. So it's people like Steve that can help you with your operation, how to lean it out, what are quality standards, what do you need to do in terms of business plan? Where can you find access to capital? All these things, that's in his ballywick. And the MEP centers, by and large, one in each state, do a very, and Puerto Rico, do a very good job of assisting manufacturers from startups to much more mature companies. So, yeah, I would say, truthfully, go again on that website, nist.gov forward slash MEP. And you can find there how to contact your local MEP center. And they will be happy to help you. I mean, it is a, cons it is a consultancy. So the, there are some fees involved. But they're far less than you would pay, uh, say, Googling somebody to try to help you. I don't know if you were here three years ago when I was in a similar forum here. But the answer, we got the same question. Basically, you have three options. You can go to a contract manufacturer because you don't want to deal with the whole the dynamic that here poor John had to deal with. You can then basically do it yourself and then learn everything that, that John has basically been working on. Or you can do a hybrid where you can then basically do some of it yourself but then have somebody else do something else. So Steve can provide you more details on those options. But 
But those are normally when, when they ask us that question, you go with those three. You can, and let me tell you, there are contra manufacturers in Virginia, there are contra manufacturers in Maryland, so you can find those people. However, the economics are different. If you have somebody that is going to make it for you, then you may not be making that. Yeah, so, but yeah. Steve, you know, the, here's your guy. So, go, go when, when we first started um, and we were only two people, we had to figure out a way to get to a design without an electrical engineer, without a true mechanical engineer. And so we did do some contract manufacturing. Um, and now that we've grown, we filled in those holes in our company and now we do everything in house. Yeah. Okay, we're almost nine more minutes. Let me see how we do a quick one here. Then. Let's talk briefly about supply chain. Like, you know, you, do you worry about like, you know, you don't find people to give you materials. So maybe you can elaborate on that. and. I know our friend Steve here does a lot of, you know, basically finding suppliers. So, you know, you go, John, and then, but, okay, you can go, Steve. Yeah, I mean, just to get it, the conversation started, uh, when John, John was, uh, he, he had, his contracting was actually outside, um, and he was bringing it in and doing some of it in-house. And so what we were able to do was actually, since we deal with every manufacturer in Virginia, many of those, we had a lot of contacts that we were able to get to John and say, if you decided to make it in Virginia, here are some contacts that you can reach out to. And so try to hit the gaps for what, you know, suppose something happened at the location that he was getting his material, et cetera, from, then he would be maybe down for six to eight months before he could get something in. So to at least have a backup plan as well as far as help, helping him with the different resources across the state of Virginia and outside if needed. But we pretty much were able to find a lot of people and that make circuit boards to fabrication to whatever was needed to make sure that he had a supply chain with that. And to give you a little background on Gen Edge, during the pandemic, the state of Virginia reached out to Gen Edge in order to find manufacturing for PPE products, um, hand sanitizer, the face masks. So we helped startup companies in those areas. We were the ones that was go-to. We were, we were boots on the ground, trying to bring people together, helping the supply chain in that and some of the, in, in the gaps that we had. And um, from that, that's the reason why John ended up in our program because he felt he fell right into one of those um, strategic areas that needed to be fulfilled. And your version, John, of that? <laughs> I think I could talk on supply chain for an hour. Um, uh, supply chain is is all encompassing because supply chain dictates whether you can get materials, um, and if you think that you may not be able to get materials, it dictates how much inventory you keep, and how much inventory you keep dictates how much capital you have, and how much capital you have dictates how much capital you have to have. And so um, sort of that recurring cycle is something that we think about almost every day. Um, and ours is interesting because we're a manufacturer. We manufacture um, high-tech products in Central Virginia, but we also pull in different pieces from I think 10 different countries and you know multiple different states, including Virginia, heavily as heavily as we can. And um, managing all of that, all 350 pieces of our build, um, just requires us to think about if this one thing goes down, how does it affect us in delivering to our customers, right? And so thinking about if something that is a six to eight week lead time moves to a six to eight month lead time, wh what does that do to your business? Um, and so just not necessarily making actionable choices about those right up front, but at least being aware of them, I think is really important and just having a thought about it. What happens when my, you know, what happens if any of my suppliers decide to change lead times by a factor of five, by a factor of 10, um, do I have other sources that I can go to, right? Um, you know, early on when we were starting manufacturing, we had a few manufacturers that we used that ended up not being very reliable. And so we had to go and find other sources to get those. 
And I look back on that and think that it's one of the best things that happened to us because we have multiple places that we can get almost everything that we have now. Um, and so we had to think about it from a design perspective and it forced us to make, make some really hard choices early on. And I think not necessarily making those choices early on, but at least thinking about them and just thinking about where do I source my materials? What is the most pivotal, pivotal thing in what I'm manufacturing? And then thinking about where could I get that if I couldn't get it from that person or from that company. We're almost done. We got five more minutes. So each one of you will get one minute to give some advice here to our innovators. But before that, I knew Marlon was a very shy guy. I had no idea that Steve was also. Let me tell you one thing about COVID, what these people did. You know, when COVID happened, and I know a lot of us lost some, you know, some friends and family. These centers, and I was right in the middle trying to figure out what they were doing, they were out there because if you don't know this, manufacturing still was working during COVID. I mean, manufacturing was still operating. These guys would actually start identifying how can they pivot to start making all this personal professional equipment. I went to a webinar that these people organized where they have 500 people connected basically on the webinar to figure out what is regulated and what is not regulated under the PPEs. Unreal because there was a lot of noise out there, and that's what these guys do. They were also the interface, basically because all, everything was assigned to the, to the state government, the emergency management. They were the one that connected the manufacturers to the emergency management agency to the clients, like the hospitals. So that's, they came up and then they started doing it, and now they're back to no, the new normal, I guess they call it. So guys, to wrap it up, I need a one minute Give some great advice to here to our colleagues and innovators. So let's start with Marlon first. So Marlon, why don't you give them some great advice? Well, the great advice I would give you is this. Contact your local MEP center <laughs> if you need assistance in terms of all the things that we talked about today. If you're interested in assistance in terms of Matter or Matter Plus, certainly Matter Plus, really go to the website, nist.gov slash MEP hit the Matter tab and Matter Plus tab, and uh, you can actually, at the bottom of the page, uh, make a request. And the Matter Plus team, of which I'm one member and Jose is actually another, will look at your request and see if we can't find someone at NIST that can assist you. Steve? Steve? Okay. Um, I would say you all wear a lot of hats. Don't do it alone. Build a team of uh, support staff, whatever that looks like, friends, family, reach out for expertise in different areas. Don't try to do this by yourself because you will burn yourself out. We are here from a manufacturing point of view to be a support to you. You have SBDC that can help you with uh, many things as well. But if you're in the process or going to manufacture it yourself, please reach out to us. And um, I guess the last thing is don't give up, you know, live your dream, make memories. Yeah. Go on. And I'm just going to parrot what they just said because, um, I mean, I think the thing that's been the most helpful for me in my journey is, I mean, you as an inventor know what you're inventing and, and what you're trying to manufacture. Um, but the important thing is knowing all the things you don't know and trying to find people around you who know about those things. So this is matter you know, and connecting to NIST for, you know, maybe getting to a standard. Um, this is connecting with MEP, with SPDC. Uh, Virginia has VIPC, which is Virginia Innovation Partnership Council. Um, there, there are just, I, I've been blown away consistently at the number of resources, and most of them being free, um, that are available to you. And, you know, use them. They're incredibly helpful, and they're there to, to make sure that you can succeed as, as much as you can. For me, basically everything they said, and one more thing, uh, Sean, show your face here one moment. Here's their guy. I mean, this guy is amazing. I love him to death. He's like a brother to me. So go to him, then he will refer you to me again. But keep your dream, though. I mean, I really envy you guys. I never basically made that step to becoming an innovator. I always had to work for somebody. But I, I hopefully my next quest, I become one of you. But Thank you, Sean. I mean, I always love it. So, and thank you, guys. <laughs>